Good day. I'm Colonel Jerry Morlock, the director of the Combat Studies Institute. You're about to use a video series which our instructors have prepared for the sole purpose of approving your presentation of M610, The Evolution of Modern Warfare. We've taken care to make the course that you teach as similar to the one taught at Fort Leavenworth as possible and choose to add these tapes to your libraries in order to give you every advantage as you prepare to teach this new course. These tapes are similar to the weekly train-up sessions which we utilize to prepare our instructors here at Fort Leavenworth. My intent for the tape sessions was to provide you insights and tips on ways to approach the lessons of M610 that were not available in the instructor notes. I've drawn various instructors, military and civilian, into the sessions based upon their specific expertise and historical background. They were asked to just talk to the lesson structure and content, giving you some additional information on the historical context and differing views on how to approach the lessons. These tapes will provide you a wealth of knowledge and direction that will significantly improve your readiness to teach our new history course. One word of caution regarding how to use these training tapes. They are not designed to be substituted for your instruction during the individual lessons of the course. As instructor preparation tapes, train the training material, if you will, they are inappropriate for direct instruction to students and are not intended for that purpose. Our intent with these tapes is to improve your ability to lead the student seminars by sharing tips and advice from some highly qualified experts. The Combat Studies Institute stands ready to provide whatever additional expertise or assistance that you may require, and we've included the Institute's phone, mail, and email contact information on the tape if you should need it. Good luck with the Evolution of Modern Warfare course, and have a good time. We're going to be talking about this World War I lesson and discussing some approaches to the lesson, um, ways for you to get into the lesson uh, with your students, and also trying to give you some background information um, in terms of what does World War I mean overall, and maybe give you some pointers on some places to go. Uh, that said, um, we might as well kick off. So the World War I lesson, um, if it was my druthers, we'd have like 12 lessons on World War I in this course, but that's not my position. Um, what you're saying is it's going to be difficult to put everything of significance in World War I into one two-hour class. Is that what you're trying to say? That's what I'm trying to say. I suspect you're right there. Looks like our... Uh, we have our work cut out for us in that case. Yeah, yeah, I think we do. I'd offer a thing that I, I one of the biggest problems with teaching war, one of my opinion, is is dispel the sort of the, the myths and, and the, the stereotypes that are associated with the war. And when you when you mention World War One, student is, is will tend to say, well. It's all stupidity. The generals were stupid, and the guys went over the top again and again. And the machine guns—it was mud and trenches. And that's all I need to know. Uh, and that's that's a, that's a hurdle that an instructor is going to have to get past. Mm -hmm. uh, that there's nothing to be learned from it because it's just a, a glaring example of military stupidity. Mm -hmm. Well, there's plenty of that in there involved too, but there's a lot lot more to it as well. Uh, uh, another problem you might have. Uh, teaching World War I, there'll be a lot of people who want to talk about the origins piece, because that's what general historians like to talk about. You know, what led to the war, the causes of it, and also his, general historians will like to talk about what came out of it, the important things, whether it's the Russian Revolution, America's emergence as a world power, uh, the destruction of the, uh, the monarchies in Europe, for example. But in a military history course, we need to focus, and, and you, you're going to have to push your students, I believe, into looking at the military developments in that, that period. And we all uh, have seen this slide, I like to use a slide, uh, at, at the end of uh, Teaching World War I, where JFC Fuller, the famous British military historian, says there were more changes, that the war is more different, uh, or changes more in the period between 1914 and 1918 than it had during the entire previous century. And that sort of causes eyebrows to come up and say, ooh. 
no, what's we, going on here? We, we go from, at the tactical level of war, um, massed formations, um, direct fire artillery, uh, a lot of officers still contemplating the use of mounted horse cavalry, mm -hmm. um, very, very limited role for aviation, if any at all, to by the end of the war, um, kind of going backwards, mm -hmm. aviation has developed every one of the roles that it will eventually fulfill down the road. Um, the mounted arm is already appearing to be tanks and armored cars. Um, artillery has gotten very complex in firing indirect fire roles. It's a three-dimensional battlefield. It's a very much a three-dimensional battlefield. And infantry is now performing much like infantry does today. You know, very dispersed, very open order, squad level maneuvering. A variety of arms and down to down into each infantry squad and company. Yeah. And all of that occurs in a four-year period. It's amazing. And that's at the tactical level. At the strategic level, and that's really where this lessons readings focus more than anything else, is at the strategic level of war, a lot of things change there, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe the, the approach to take with this lesson is to discuss change. How do armies change? And especially how do armies change in the crucible of a tremendous conflict mm -hmm. with, with the stakes being very high? Mm -hmm. How do you go about choosing which way yeah. to change? One, one caveat, though, we must keep in mind, and that clearly is that uh, what is obvious to us was not obvious to the commanders and to the national leaders in 1915 and 1916. Before we were too harsh on them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we must keep in mind that we have now a 75-year perspective on this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's easy for us to condemn them as to being blind, foolish, anachronistic, uh, mm -hmm. any number of other terms that we may might wish to apply to them, but uh, they were working within the context of how they understood warfare. Mm -hmm. So let's not judge them uh, too harshly. Yeah. They probably thought of themselves also as being uh, very well educated. They were. And uh, forward thinking. And they were. Too. So uh, it, we're going to have some difficulty attempting to put them in, into their perspective. Um, your job as a facilitator is to get your students to talk intelligently about the readings that they've had for this week and hopefully to link some of the, uh, the readings from lesson to lesson. Uh, we do have a number of very fine readings this week and I would suggest uh, using them. Um, it usually helps. not It usually helps. Uh, we do have a piece by Gunther Rotenberg in uh, Makers of Modern Strategy on the Schlieffen plan. I think you can get a lot of mileage out of that. Um, at the strategic level, we also have uh, part of a uh, essay by Gordon Craig um, on what happens at the strategic and political level in uh, Germany, France, and England in the first several years of the war, which, in which we can address the changes in war at the political and strategic level. Uh, our good uh, Sergeant Dr. Broom has provided us with an excellent essay on ground combat in 1916 and how warfare has changed by then. This is a very important essay and you can use it to demonstrate how warfare has changed on the ground. And there's, we also have three pages of Wigley, which I'd, I'd like to ask, ask you guys about, about how to use it. Mm -hmm. And as an umbrella reading for the entire period, we have uh, okay. Larry Addington's overview of the war. Mm -hmm. So, in light of this, uh, I would suggest approaching the lesson chronologically, mm -hmm. opening up in the same manner with the Schlieffen plan first. Their plans, their vision of, mm -hmm. of on, for allies and the, and the central powers, how they thought the war would go, how combats would go, and then the ugly, the ugly reality of combat. Mm -hmm. um, 
and getting to 1918 and trying to escape mm -hmm. the uh, the trap of uh, of trench warfare. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that that's that's how I would approach it. Yeah, I think that's a nice link with the last lesson is is to open up with. Uh, you might want to briefly review what are the causes, but you can't get tr get locked into that. But to say what kind of war did they expect, mm -hmm. and how does the, how does the Schlieffen plan answer the German problem? Why do they need a plan like that? It's the most famous war plan, and arguably the most famous war plan in history. And I having the students discuss what is it. Uh, is it a work of genius, as some some people uh, consider it to be, or is it something fatally flawed that, that uh, set Germany up for a catastrophic failure? Uh, <laughs> describe uh, how it went and, then, and how it eventually broke down. Uh, I think are all things that students uh, can spend some worthwhile discussion time on. I, I would agree. Um, that, that that's the best way to approach it. If there's a weakness in this lesson, it's in the middle part of the war, in the years 15, Your essay, 16, words, no, 17. Kidding. Yeah, my essay. <laughs> um, you know, it, it was it was adapted for this course out of something else, but say it ain't so. <laughs> um, because it's you know it's very heavy on the on the opening piece of the war with the Schlieffen plan mm -hmm. and all of that and it's it's you know pretty good on on 1918 yeah. and what the war has become and the strategic problems of Germany at that point um, and the the position yeah. they're in but the the fascinating piece of the story um, in a lot of ways are all of those attempts. Um, really in 1916 and 1917 mm -hmm. to figure out, okay, we've got this can of worms and how do we put them back in it? Yeah. For those of us who are, are thinking about new technologies being introduced today and how they will influence the military of tomorrow, uh, it will probably be instructive to examine how some of these technological wonders of World War I mm -hmm. were introduced and the process of how institutions receive these items. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think uh, that would be a worthwhile line of inquiry. But one must not only focus on those that are successful, but on those that, that failed. That failed. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. You mentioned how to use the, the Wigley piece in here. And I think um, it, it's natural for American Army officers especially to say, hey, you know, how come, how come this lesson doesn't really deal with the Americans a whole lot? And. Um, I really think that the the response to that, and because I mean we've got the three pages out of Wigley, mm -hmm. essentially the talk about World War One. He gives it short shrift. Um, he does give it short shrift, but the pieces of World War One that are most important for American military history is one, just America entering the world stage as a mm -hmm. great power, and second, what we learn about mobilization mm -hmm. in this modern age, yeah. because the American combat experience is very, very. Very brief. Yeah. It, in effect, we're on. We're players, big players on on the Western Front. Really, about the last three months of the war, and mm -hmm. the European sources will tend to tend to downplay it. You'll have students in the class who will say, "Hey, we want to talk about the American experience. We want to. We'd like to get into that more." And if you're going to do that, that's going to be up to the instructor to carry it because there's there's not much in the lesson that, that'll let you work with that. A couple things that I think are worth highlighting. The points you make. What is the mobilization experience? What are the problems we have? Uh, how do we overcome them? How do we perform on the battlefield? Uh, what what compromises do we make with our allies? These are all things that, that are worth talking about. But if you're going to do that, you're going to uh, you're going to have to carry it on your own. I, I think a point worth making is. Uh, it is, I'd argue, one of the great force, maybe the greatest force projection operation in history at that point, to move two million Americans over uh, to the Western Front by the end of the war. And your students may tend to say, well, yeah, and that's, it's the Americans then that win World War I. I, I would tend to disagree with that. So I, it's the potential. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Little Hart's point. Well, the Americans didn't win the war, but they guaranteed the Allies would win the war. Mm -hmm. uh, no, they guaranteed the Allies wouldn't lose the war. Well, perhaps. That's, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that could very well be, too. I think the, the uh, ultimate uh, conclusion is we're still in doubt as of, of the spring of 1918. Summer of 1918. Summer of 1918. Yeah. Well, maybe we're asking the wrong question. And maybe the right question is uh, one of those reading questions mm -hmm. on, the, on the second page, which is where are we at in the evolution of modern warfare? Mm -hmm. And you can use the American example mm -hmm. as, mm -hmm. as part of mm -hmm. answering that question. Mm -hmm. but, but clearly, 
most of the focus is on, most of the readings deal with the other uh, European nations. On, on the other hand, in the sweep of this course, you're now getting to a period where some of the students will know something beyond what they have read specifically for this course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them have little or no knowledge about uh, 19th century European institutions and warfare, yeah. but uh, they've all had something, yeah. however uh, yeah. unimportant it may have been, focusing on the American aspect of this war in their high school or their college uh, history courses. And I, I think that's an, that's an important point. And you as facilitators should use this. There will be individuals with specialized knowledge about important parts of World War I. And go ahead and take advantage of their knowledge and their experience. Um, I like to have my students see new and different perspectives of not just World War I, but the other lessons too. Mm -hmm. And I use two essays in Studies in Battle Command. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, but I ask for volunteers. Uh, one each to uh, brief on two essays. One um, on page 87 by Dr. George Gavrich called The Rock of Gallipoli, about Camille Ataturk, the Battle of Gallipoli. And on page 97, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Silverstone's essay on um, General Monash and the Battle of Hamel, in which the Aust Australian Army goes on the offensive against the Germans in 1918. Uh, different perspectives to show what's happening mm -hmm. on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. uh, these are short presentations, no more than five minutes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think it's a productive way to get into the thing. I, it, one of the themes I like to, to get get into the discussion right away, and something that all, all students ought to be able to at least have an opinion on, is, is the relation of, of political and military leadership. And the sleeping plan allows you to get into that, and then you can you can go a little farther with the Gordon Craig essay. This is, this is arguably the first uh, total war in history. Uh, and the civilian leadership expected the military people to have the answers. Uh, though no one had ever ever really mobilized an entire society and, and, and got into a war that, that drew on every aspect of society, that, that tested every aspect of society, its social, economic, political institutions. And uh, Craig, would, Craig would suggest that uh, civilian leadership expected a, a little too much of the military people. Sleep plan is a good vehicle because uh, when it got down to the nuts and bolts of what was going on, the political leadership in Germany didn't know what the details really meant, what uh, the, the, even the broad points of the sleep plan, they didn't understand that. And uh, as, as the train started moving, all of a sudden they found themselves in a situation they couldn't call it back, this, this thing that they had unleashed. And it, it's worth asking, you know, again, sort of a shameless ploy to, to, to get to draw relevance out of this course. What are the responsibilities of civilian leaders in understanding uh, how the military operates, how they plan? Uh, and, and what you'll do, you'll see a completely different uh, political and military culture at work in Germany. And, and it might be useful, worthwhile to contrast that with how we do business here in the United States and the relationship of military and civilian. Uh, today, yes, I think you yeah. get some good, good mileage out of that. But uh, to return to Craig's essay, mm -hmm. uh, we have three different governments. Right. Uh, in England, France, and Germany, they will all face the same dilemmas, and none of them do too well. Nope. Um, isn't, isn't indicated there. Mm -hmm. yeah, if, if the uh, civilian governments expect too much from the civilians, it may be because, or from the military, maybe because the military misled them uh, in in what they could expect. Yeah. Or perhaps perhaps has too much prestige in uh, yeah. in society, too, society. too great a yeah. role in the yeah. decision making process. Yeah. Well, it, it begs the question. I think uh, how much should a, a political leader know about military affairs? Uh, in another example, for in uh, late 1916, you have the German government. The German Navy comes in with a set of charts that says we can win the war in five months if you just let us unleash our U-boats. Mm -hmm. What's a political leader supposed to say in that? In that, okay, what, how does he respond when a, when a technical expert can lay it out, chapter and verse and PowerPoint slides that hey, I've got the answer right here. Uh, in the Craig article, they point out that Clemenceau had a military advisor who could whisper in his ear, hey boss, I think the generals are giving you a line here. And, and maybe which that's is, where it which gave him the... fascinating point. Which maybe gave him the ability to, uh, to, to challenge the generals when it came to making strategic decisions. Perhaps that's why we've become awfully cynical of technical experts uh, here by, at the end of or the century. Uh, 
Um, there's a, an interesting analogy that, that you kind of mentioned when you were talking about the sleeping plan and the, and the civilian reaction once that whole process began. And that is that, that one of the most important books in the early 1960s was uh, Barbara Tuchman's The Guns of August. And that, that book had a tremendous impact on, uh, on American uh, political and military thinking at the beginning of the 1960s. Um, because of the similarities mm -hmm. in, in a lot of uh, ways between the mobilization system that these countries used and intercontinental ballistic missiles. Yeah. That once you order mobilization, you either have to go all the way through with the attack mm -hmm. or you leave yourself mm -hmm. naked as you try to, to stop the mobilization in the mm -hmm. middle because the trains will be all confused, the units won't be in the right mm -hmm. place, and you'll essentially be defenseless. And if you launch ICBMs, and you decide, oops, we made a mistake, you can't call them back. Mm -hmm. The only thing you can do is destroy them in midair. And at that point, once again, you're laying there defenseless in front of a still-armed enemy. Mm -hmm. So those analogies had a tremendous impact on the, on the Kennedy administration. And that, that might be another way to draw out the relevancy of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. That you know, World War I didn't really end in 1918. You know, there are some things about it that are still well, shaped our today. shaped our whole century. And if students mm -hmm. want to talk about that, you can get into that. Uh, in terms of the military aspect, again, you got to come back to what's the problem that the generals face after their war plans fail. What do you do now? Yeah. And this is the test of all military institutions. And Michael Howard's famous essay: Whatever doctrine you pl you go into war with, you're going to find it wanting in some way. It's not going to, to pass the test in all accounts. So the trick is to develop the mental flexibility, uh, the versatility that says, okay, I've seen the test of battle now, here's how I'm going to change. And apparently, on the face of it, you've got every army, major army in the world, doesn't pass the test because you have a slaughter that goes on for, for years afterwards. For years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's some additional CSI readings. There's one listed in the, in the, uh, the student book, uh, the directed telescope reading by Colonel Gary Griffin. Uh, but there's also a number of other uh, related pieces. Uh, Sam mentioned studies in battle command. Uh, there's also uh, Tim Lupfer's uh, Dynamics of Doctrine. Dynamics of Doctrine. Although, although it, is, it, is, it is not two five-page essays. The, it, it's about 100 pages. 60, 60, right. page, 60 pages, thank you. Yeah. Um, that deal with how the German general staff approached well, change already happening on the battlefield. Right. Um, and then there's uh, Jonathan M. House's uh, Combined Arms. Toward Combined Arms toward Warfare. Combined Arms Warfare, which is another CSI publication. Pretty succinct summation of what's going on in the tactical battlefield, and I strongly would recommend that to folks who want to get a, an overview of what's going on. Um, and of course, if, if that's too much reading for your students, and it is, it's something that, that you may go ahead and, and either you know, parcel out to a couple students or just read yourself to give you the background to facilitate and lead this discussion. Um, and those publications can be had by contacting us here at CSI and, uh, and asking for them, and we can get them out to you. Um, not in a whole lot of quantity for nothing, but we can get, we can get some out to you um, uh, to help you out there. Um, so where else do we go here today to try and help these folks out? Well, a couple points I'd like to make about the, the, the trench warfare piece again, which is locked in most students' mind. This is what World War One's about. A couple, first of all, the war didn't happen exclusively on the Western Front. Uh, a point worth making in passing. There's there's fighting in China between Japanese and Germany in their colonies. There's fighting in, in Af East Africa that goes on the entire war. Into 1919, yeah. in fact. Uh, there's uh, naval naval fighting off the coast of Chile in the Falkland Islands. There, there is, uh, of course, U-boat campaigns across the, the commerce raiding into the Indian Ocean. The British uh, Army is surrounded and surrenders in Baghdad. Yeah. Or near Baghdad, yeah. Near yeah. Baghdad, yeah. Uh, it, it is a world war, but, but coming back to the Western Front, it, it's more than guys failing to uh, run into barbed wire and getting shot down by machine guns. As early as, as 1915, 
uh, armies are starting to figure out the first part of the problem. Uh, that is, yeah, there's a three-part problem. Some authors would say it's not only do you have to break into the enemy trench system, which is going to be deep uh, by the end of the war, very sophisticated, you've got to break through the trench system and break out of the, the trench system. And I said as early as 1915, they'd figured out the first part of that. In most, in most. Uh, as 16 and 17 come along, they're figuring out the second part of it, but it's not until 1918 that people have figured out really the third part. How do you break into, break through, and then break out of a trench system, out into the enemy's rear area? And even then, uh, exploiting the successes you have is something that eludes them. It's going to wait for the. How, how, how do you exploit in World War I? Mm -hmm. you, you don't have the technological capability. Um, if, if you think about the problem as one of movement, the problems of the attacker become real apparent as you look at World War I. First, you've got the area of your own trenches pounded by the artillery for a couple of years, mm -hmm. so it's a mess. Then you've got no man's land mm -hmm. full of, uh, of craters mm -hmm. and, and you know leftover gas and barbed wire and all kinds of fun things. Not the best place in the world to move across. You've got the enemy's trench system. Mm -hmm. It's not a yeah. single trench, it's, it's a system. A, it's a system of at least three layers. Mm -hmm. um, and which, it which, may, which may be as much as uh, two to three kilometers deep. Mm -hmm. uh, so greater, so we're not talking yeah. more. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> that area as well is chewed up. Mm -hmm. You as the attacker have to cross no man's land, mm -hmm. cross the enemy's trench system, mm -hmm. and then try to break out yeah. through all of this difficult country. And the only way you can do that, basically, is on foot. The enemy, meanwhile, moving reserves to block you, yeah. is moving behind his trench system in virgin territory where he's got a road and railroad network so uh -huh. he can move by rail and by truck. He can move faster laterally than you can through the position. That's right. And it, it's extremely yeah. difficult. Yeah. And then there's the command and control part of the problem. Yeah. How do you control this thing? Yeah, I, I draw it to, Wire in the attack? To, I draw it to the students. If you're a brigade commander at a battle, say, like the Somme, and you see the first wave go over the top and then disappear over the reverse slope of it, how do you make the decision to send the follow-on? Do you send the second wave and third wave? You know, how do you make those kind of decisions? Uh, you know, do you rely on the carrier pigeons to get back in time? Well, your schedule doesn't allow that. If you're going to support the guys who went over in the first wave, you've got to send them. Uh, there's not much to support that kind of decision making. The dilemma of those guys. Again, we, we tend to think of them as stupid without looking at the, the, the real limitations they had to work with. It's, it's a the, tough situation. The, the killing technology is virtually the killing technology of today. Mm -hmm. The communications and command and control and movement technology is not 19th that. century. Is, is 19th century. Yeah. And that, that provides point. a real difficult problem for these guys to work out. Yeah. Another part about the Western Front, again, to get past the machine guns mowing guys down the barbed wire, uh, you have millions of so There are other fronts going on, as I said before. In the Russian Front, you have uh, you have millions of troops involved. But because of the, the, the sheer size of the space involved, that front moves back hundreds of miles throughout the war. They don't have this, the stagnant trench systems. It, what, it's, what it is on the Western Front, along with technology, is just the sheer density of troops. As you point out, mm -hmm. you can break into the enemy's trench system, but he has reserve formation behind reserve formation behind reserve formation ready to move up and plug the gap. Uh, that's the other piece. You know, the world has never seen armies of that size thrown together from the English Channel down to the Swiss border. We, we didn't even, you know, repeat those numbers in World War II mm -hmm. on the Western Front. Um, you know, didn't really approach them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the British and French and Americans are pushing, what is it, 200 divisions combined by the end of the war mm -hmm. on the Western Front. And, you know, in, in World War uh, Two, if I remember right, between the British and Americans, there, there's like 80 and 90, 80 and 90 total. Nope. You know, I mean, you know, um, so the, the density of forces is, is another amazing. significant factor. Right. Well, we also had to keep these various uh, fronts in perspective. The reason we talk so much about the Western Front is because it's pertinent to the specific uh, objectives of our uh, course. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not to to say that nothing else happens, but mm -hmm. this is this is where we find the origins of later World War II and after World War II doctrine. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why we focus on this, not because it's it's the only or the best 
just war, but because it's pertinent yeah. to what we're going to look at later on in this course. It's probably the biggest concentration of what yeah. we're going to look at later on. Jerry, would you like to talk a little bit about World War I aviation? Of course, uh, there were uh, airplanes prior to uh, World War I. Uh, we all know the story of the uh, Wright brothers, and uh, for a decade uh, there have been air forces uh, of, of a sort being uh, developed, some of them uh, more vigorously than, than others. Uh, but it was uh, certainly the war itself that gave the impetus to a lot of uh, experimentation and development of, uh, of the aircraft as a, an integral weapon of war. We, uh, we see this specifically in the case of uh, France, Germany, Britain, uh, Italy, which uh, are the most uh, progressive in developing their air arms. The United States is uh, uh, extremely slow for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's a small army. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, resources available to uh, put a lot of money into air development. Uh, even in the uh, expedition down on the Mexican border in 1916, it's almost a pathetic use of the American airplane. Uh, on the other hand, there are some very progressive, forward-looking uh, people uh, in, in all countries who uh, make claims, sometimes claims that cannot be uh, lived up to by the level of technology at that time, but that provides a cutting edge. Mm -hmm. And it does, in fact, uh, bode well for the future of aviation, because uh, as uh, s stated earlier in our session here, everything that you will see uh, in World War II in aviation is available in some nascent form during World War I, uh, beginning with, uh, with observation and scouting, uh, bombing, strategic bombing, interdiction, close air support, and of course, uh, air-to-air -air combat. All of that is, is available. Well, there's, um, even, there's even limited attempts at some, some aerial resupply. And so, anti-submarine warfare. Anti-submarine warfare anti using aircraft. And, and, and by, uh, by 1918, uh, this uh, arm has been transformed from uh, a, a very, very primitive uh, weapon into something that is quite sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, what will happen later on is uh, tremendous advances in technology, uh, power plants will improve, airframes will become stronger, heavier, uh, ranges and altitudes will grow, but, but basically uh, all the missions that we will see later mm -hmm. uh, are, are being developed. Uh, uh, and, and surprisingly enough, uh, some of the people doing experimentations are people who later on will not have such a major role. The Italians are very progressive mm -hmm. in their, mm -hmm. their aviation industry. The Russians are doing a lot of innovative kind of things, even though they have very limited uh, resources mm -hmm. and uh, and once again because of uh, uh, a few specific individuals who have made a significant mark on uh, the uh, future of military aviation we tend to look at the Western Front mm -hmm. but that's not the only place that uh, mm -hmm. military aviation is uh, is developing at this time yeah. mm -hmm. well, I find it significant that uh, the on the Italian front as you mentioned that some, some Austrian German bombing of Italian cities and, and the Zeppelins appearing over London and cause in the, both places some brief panic that, that that let the exponents of air power later on say, hey, here's the here's the key toward winning a war like this is go over the trenches and crack civilian morale. We'll, you'll talk about that in the next lesson. About in the end well, of all of the the big names in World War II military aviation will uh, appear on the scene in uh, 1917, mm -hmm. 1918. Douay is uh, beginning to formulate his ideas, which he will write down later on. The question is whether they appear to be court-martialed or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they have their problems. They have their problems. But, yeah, the role uh, but guys like military. Trenchard and Harris, all of these guys mm -hmm. are uh, getting their uh, their baptism of aviation fire, as it were. Yeah. And perhaps building uh, their empires. And, and perhaps beginning to uh, to build empires. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Mitchell of course, uh, although he's not a major player, he, he 
is much larger in retrospect than he was at the time, mm -hmm. uh, is certainly gathering up his uh, little bag of tricks, which he will then come home uh, and uh, and unleash. He's a showman even during during World War One, and he will continue that uh, uh, that trait uh, later on. So all of these guys we will see later uh, in the interwar period and in World War II uh, are, are all uh, learning something about their trade, mm -hmm. uh, in especially in 1917, 1918. So. How about the war at sea? Can, uh, can we recommend uh, perhaps having a, uh, a student volunteer to, uh, to brief on some aspect of the war at sea? Um, yeah, I would think so. There are two, two pretty critical aspects of the war at sea that, that folks could look at. Uh, the first one is the, the patently obvious uh, submarine war. Yeah. Uh, and again, they have the, the, the admirals have the same problem generals have. They, they had all anticipated a war where, where big fleets with big guns, battleships duke it out in the line of battle. And that happens one time uh, indecisively. Sort of. Yeah, indecisively. Uh, the real key to the war at sea is, is the new weapons on the scene. Uh, the torpedo boats, the submarines, the mines. Mines, um, the, the sea control kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there's the, there's the submarine piece or the, the, uh, um, the, the problem of Britain and, and how, do you, how do you keep Britain supplied. Uh, the Germans have some very successful um, uh, surface raiders uh, that are out um, doing some uh, tremendous... Briefly damage. successful. Briefly successful. The British will hunt them down. Um, but w at what cost? <coughs> you hunt them down, but it takes some tremendous resources to do so. It's a big ocean. Big ocean. Uh, they're hard to find. Uh, you have to put an awful lot of ships to sea mm -hmm. to find that one little ship out there mm -hmm. that's creating a lot of mischief and mayhem. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a there's a uh, there's a, a cost to be paid, but they do hunt them down. But then there's the submarine issue of of here's this new weapon. Mm -hmm. um, that is not only pretty lethal, but it, it hides pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find it? Um, what's the what's the strategic level response mm -hmm. to the submarine? I, do yeah. you go to convoying? Yeah. You know, your history for you know 250 years has said the price of convoying is too high. Because if the bad guys get into the convoy, they're going to take it out. Plus, waiting for ships to assemble a convoy just slows put, down your. Put, yeah, just puts such a damper on your on your commerce that you just you don't want to pay that yeah, price. So there's there's a lot of problems. Plus, with it's that. more it's a more manly thing to go out and chase submarines right. rather than assign ships to to, to escort duty, which is pretty pretty dull and boring. Um, and then there's the technical aspects of okay, you know, once you've decided how you're going to go about fighting them, how do you develop the technological pieces yeah. to actually pull that off? So that's one area that, that students could explore. Can I pick up on that? It, some folks even suggest, though, that the, the dilemma, the U-boats the themselves, the limitations uh, cause some, some tough problems. If you're going to use them, it uh, means you're going to have to violate the, the established practice of, of naval warfare. And this is the trick bag the Germans get in. Do we, do we risk bringing America into the war in early 1917? And when they're willing, by taking that risk, some people say that's, uh, to use one phrase, the echo of the Schlieffen plan. You, you originally you have a war plan that 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 will bring Britain in, okay? If you're going to fight Britain, you're going to have to have U-boats. To make them effective, you're going to have to use unrestricted submarine warfare, and then again, you run the risk of bringing America in. Again, the Schlieffen plan, or its its effects, come back to haunt, you could argue, come back to haunt the Germans again and again. Absolutely. After the year of 1916, though, when clearly we saw the effects of attrition, mm -hmm. is that not a reasonable risk for the Germans to take? If they can take Britain out in time. If the Admiral's predictions are, are, are uh, And in fact, other than the movement of manpower, which you've already referred to earlier, uh, the United States uh, has a great many problems with its industrial mobilization. And uh, it's possible to argue that the Germans take a reasonable risk like any risk, sometimes sure. it fails. Well, it, it's. I'm, I'm not well, sure I'm going to. If I'm the German general staff and I'm looking at the American army in, in late 1916, I'm, I'm looking at an army that had a hard time putting an understrength division on the Mexican border. And I'm saying, wait, there's, I got 200 divisions on the Western Front and, and a million men in the East. I'm not sure that I, I, can, I can worry too much about these guys. This, this does sound like a pretty risk. Re I think it's a reasonable risk that the Germans take. Well, not only that, but. They come fairly close 
to causing Britain. What, Britain's Real within problems. five weeks of starvation? Yeah. There, and there are five weeks of supplies left? We talked about the American contribution to the war. Uh -huh. And you know the psychological aspect of the American potential yeah. begins to play in 1918. But America may very well have contributed one of the most significant decisions to winning World War I in 1917. When the British ask for American naval help mm -hmm. in the North Sea, and the Americans say, we'll be happy to give you help, but we're going to start convoying. And that was the Americans' immediate reaction to the war situation. Admiral Sims in London said, you know, this single ship sailing stuff, you know, isn't working. We have to go to convoying. And it was his mm -hmm. pressure and the pressure of the American government that, that you know, convinced the British to do it. Well, Lloyd George, you deserve some credit well, there. Yeah, Lloyd George, but, but it was when the American Navy came in and, and really weighed in with the Royal Navy yeah. that, that the Royal yeah. Navy folded. Well, and the Navy, and our Navy by its very nature, was more prepared to go to war than the Army was. Yes. Since we have always relied up until this time on our Navy as our first line of defense, mm -hmm. the Navy was much closer to mobilization status. Yeah. Yeah, much, and well, therefore, we could put the Navy the wrong kind of ships. Well, <laughs> but so did the Brits and, and everybody else. But but the thing is, uh, we were we were more ready to go to war at sea than we were yeah. to go to yeah. war on land. Well, one thing. Let me finish up this sea warfare piece. The second different aspect for folks to look at is um, the impact of the Royal Navy that doesn't fight the battle it, it, it is dreamed of. Jutland is just almost a, a few up. opening rounds, and mm -hmm. it's it's not a real fleet-to-fleet full-up action. Um, they get rid of Hague. They're, they're structured for um, this grand climactic battle. And they never pull it off. But what is the role of the, the, the Royal Navy in the First World War? If you, if you buy a little heart, it's decisive. Absolutely, because what it does is it enforces the blockade on Germany. And in the end, it's the blockade in Germany that brings the whole house of cards down. You can argue that, yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's an argument. That, that's a well, I, I, that, would, that would tie to I think, something I, need, I think you need to talk about, looking at uh, Sarn Broom's article about 1916. By 1916, it's pretty clear you're not going to win uh, the, the achieving decisive results, a neat Napoleonic bat, uh, battlefield result that will lead to a quick victory. It, it's, that's not going to happen. No, it's not, not going to happen. So how do you win a war like that? Uh, one solution, uh, the German solution of Verdun is, well, this is, if this is going to be a war of attrition, we'll fight attrition battles that will lead to, the, to, uh, to taking selected enemies out of the war. Uh, you can criticize the Germans, Falkenhayn, the guy who dreams it up. You can criticize, look, what a butcher he is. On the other hand, you can argue this is the guy who, who first sees clearly what kind of war you're in. It's a war where you have to bleed the enemy to death because you're mobilizing entire societies. Single battles aren't going to get it. Uh, we're going to have to come up with a strategy that uh, allows us to, to take out armies. Uh, annihilation ain't going to work. Uh, to, to follow Wigley's, uh, if, if you buy that, uh, annihilation versus attrition, we're going to have to accept attrition. And what's the best way to fight attrition war? Coming back to you, the Royal Navy said, yeah, we know how to fight an attrition war. We'll starve them out. Falkenhayn says, One way we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna kill enough of them, in this case Frenchmen, that, that they'll have to give up. Right. This is a critical point in tying the lessons of World War I together with the future uh, lessons of this uh, course. And that is, in World War II, uh, the French and the British, neither one, can stand to fight a war of attrition. Mm -hmm. And that has a tremendous impact on how that war is going to be fought. So there's a direct bridge here between these battles, these attrition battles of mm -hmm. 1916, mm -hmm. and what happens in 1940 in France. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Another uh, issue that you can pull out of my article in there um, is the role of coalition warfare. Mm -hmm. When, uh, when the uh, French are on the ropes in Verdun and screaming for help, uh -huh. um, the Russians reach awful deep down in the well and pull up the Brusilov offensive to help them out. And at the same time, uh, the French are having problems at Verdun, but they have this major offensive planned with the, uh -huh. the Kitchener's new armies of Britain. Um, and 
then you know what's the relationship going to be between those two events, and how does that you know how does that that set of stuff interact? Um, not quite as much on the the coalition effort between the the Germans and the Austrians, but you can probably dig into that a mm -hmm. little bit. Well, I like I think the coalition issue is one that you can make a lot of mileage of in your article and also the Craig article. What what, do, what the coalitions give you uh, on the positive side? Numbers. Uh, well, they they give you they give you help when you're when you're in dire straits, and I think it's significant. The first major power to go out of the war is Russia in 1917. They're the one major power that doesn't have somebody that can come to their rescue. You know, if it's France, you can have the British attacking at the Somme. If, if you're the Austrians, you can have the Germans bailing you out again and again. But Russia doesn't have that help, and significantly, they're the first guys that get knocked out of the war. On the downside, coalition partners can call, can really really put a corset on your strategic options. Uh, one example is the Russians going to, going on the offensive in 1914, long before they're fully mobilized and ready to go. And, and one of the, one of the outcomes of that possibly is the, is the fiasco at Tannenberg. You have the British uh, launching at Somme, arguably before they're ready to go, and reaping some horrible results of that because the French are in such dire straits for done. You have the the failed attempt at Gallipoli to try to get aid to the to the Russians, uh, you know, operation with a, with a lot of potential, but but it doesn't pan out. I, I think the coalition issue is one that uh, deserves a lot of attention significantly. Uh, coalition war, the, the coalition piece that we think we have down now, and you can consider a coalition, coalition doctrine, there it's not very well advanced in World War One, and you don't see, for example, the Allies really working together a team until what I tell students is until the, the Germans hold a gun to their head. You know, <laughs> in, in the the spring of 1918, the Germans create, create three massive breakthroughs on the Western Front, and the, the Allies see their backs being pushed up against you the wall. You kind of go, oops. Yeah, maybe we'd better have one one, one single commander on the Western Front. That's what it takes to get a real coalition command. Right, right, absolutely. Well, um, anybody got any other burning thing we ought to let these folks in on? Uh, this is one of the most important lessons in the evolution of modern warfare. Absolutely. This, this war is of decisive importance. It's important to start off the lesson and end the lesson looking at the big picture. Where did we start out? Where are we now? Where are we going? Uh, at the end of World War One, I, I try to make a transition for my students. And it's an essay we don't use anymore, but it's Lawrence of Arabia's first essay that he wrote in uh, London when he got back from the desert in uh, 1918. And he said uh, when he was out leading the Arab armies, he, uh, he led an army into the field, and it was routed by the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire. And he realized that he could not fight against the uh, Central Powers in a conventional manner. The Ottoman Empire, what we would know today as Turkey, although much larger, used conscription, had modern weapons, and it had a general staff that sent hundreds of thousands of men out on railroads <laughs> to uh, exert force throughout, it, throughout the Mideast. And Lawrence said, I could not stand up and fight this machine and these institutions. But this, in what, what appeared to be an enormously powerful machine, actually had weaknesses because they had to get where they were going on railroads. And he suggested that by using small groups of raiders to attack the railroad lines, he could negate the enormous power of that empire, its general staff, um, in its entire uh, synchronization mm -hmm. matrix. What's the significance of this? Well, maybe somewhere along the line, the relationship between man and machine starts to change in warfare. Um, and I don't know how far along that course we are today, but I think somewhere along the line, that begins. Mm -hmm. uh, men are still important, women are important, but they serve weapons. And how far will that go? How far will it go for us? Something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. All right.
right. Well, thank you for watching us, and I hope we were able to give you some help and a few pointers on some ways to explore the issues of World War I with your students. Thanks very much, and have a good day.